that case, um, what I will do is um, say a welcome to all those who are tuning in for this session. Um, in this session, we have a number of colleagues with us on the panel, um, and we're going to be focusing on um, university and industrial collaborations and talking through how examples of how we share knowledge and enhance innovation through partnerships. Um, so hopefully that, that will be of interest and you'll get something to take away with you in terms of the practice of how it actually works and how effective that can be, as well as some of the challenges that perhaps are faced when universities and um, industry come together to collaborate. So the session features, um, I'm delighted to see a number of my colleagues from Bournemouth University and also University Hospitals Dorset. Um, and we're going to use a question and answer session to support them in, in talking you through how uh, the university has actually worked um, with University Hospitals Dorset and, and lessons learned from that more generally. Um, one of the things that you probably will have seen quite a bit in the media recently is about the government's agenda around levelling up and the, the fact that universities do play a, a key part in developing the economy, developing industry, um, all, all different levels and types of businesses, um, and also support for the public sector as well. Um, and obviously what Bournemouth University are doing with University Hospitals Dorset is, is a very local, regional aspect of how universities can actually contribute um, to the region and, and the local area as well, which is, is obviously key, especially in the area of health. Um, we also know that there's a range of government priorities around research. We have a research and development uh, roadmap that's been out for some time now. Um, and there's a people and culture strategy related to this. So the government is really pushing hard around making sure that we take a joined up approach um, across the UK. Um, and there is a lot more collaboration starting to happen. So today is, is pushing on that agenda um, and I suppose learning lessons as well. Um, just to give a little bit of um, background to the, the context of the speakers, and then I, I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, Bournemouth University have recently set up a, a partnership uh, with um, University Hospitals Dorset. And what we do is actually, we say it's fantastic, but you, you'll find out a bit more about it. But we have been working together to share knowledge and develop knowledge. We work on supporting our staff across the piece. So we come together in that partnership to work across all different areas. We don't just work in terms of research, but we also look at working practices. We look at things like governance, data. Um, so there's a whole range of aspects to the partnership. Um, it still is quite new. We've just done our one year uh, sort of annual review, um, which was really positive in terms of the feedback and the impact that we've actually had so far. Um, so it, it, it's a new partnership, so you'll get to find out maybe a few more examples in relation to that as we go on. So um, I'm going to introduce myself to you first because I've just realised I haven't done that. So um, I'm Lois Farkerson. I'm the Executive Dean of the Business School at Bournemouth University, and I'm a member of the UHD steering group um, that meets regularly um, to, to steer and direct and grow the partnership. So I'm also joined as a co-facilitator by Rachel Clark today, who is the Business School's um, Business Engagement and Knowledge Exchange Manager, um, because Rachel's actually been working uh, with me and starting to work with the partnership as well. So Rachel is co-facilitating today. Now, can I ask our other panel members uh, to introduce themselves. We'll go first to Rebecca. Yep, absolutely. So I'm Rebecca Hindley. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer within the business school. I'm actually uh, an HR practitioner. So having come from industry after 20 years, I joined Bournemouth University around eight years ago. Um, 
I live in Bournemouth and uh, have been collaborating with, well, with the hospital before it was UHD, <laughs> before it was UHD. And actually part of that transition to becoming UHD um, was a key part of the interactions and collaboration that I was involved in helping uh, transition through that through that process and, and the change process associated with it. Thanks, Rebecca. And next, I will go to Professor Rob Middleton, who is the Clinical Director of Trauma at University Hospitals, Dorset. Do you want to introduce yourself in a little bit? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so I wear two hats. I'm Professor of Orthopaedics and Head of the Orthopaedic Research Institute at Bournemouth University, but I'm also a consultant orthopaedic surgeon at University Hospitals, Dorset. So uh, really in the ideal position, both research, but actually delivering care in the NHS. Uh, I've also been um, involved in uh, NHS developments. I was uh, head of uh, the uh, hip and knee replacement program by the National Institute of Innovation and Research. And I've also sat on NICE looking at the treatment of osteoarthritis. So hopefully I can bring um, some national agendas to our local agenda, but I'm a, a local clinician uh, and local academic. Thanks, Rob. And we have Richard Renault, who is the Chief Strategy and Transformation Officer at University Hospitals Dorset. Hi there, uh, welcome. Yes, I'm Richard and uh, so Universal's Dorset is a £650 million turnover, 9,000 staff working across Bournemouth, Paul and Christchurch uh, in Dorset. Uh, and in my role uh, and, and career, um, quite a lot of collaboration with um, uh, private sector, both in um, procurement and um, partnerships, uh, as well as sort of operational uh, management. So um, have, I've probably been more at the customer end of some of these uh, uh, discussions, but uh, happy to try and give you that perspective as well. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. So that brings us to um, a set of questions which we're going to, to open up with, um, and I'm going to invite the panel if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to post them um, in the, the chat. And um, I'm hoping that Rachel will also help me to uh, bring up any of those questions either at the end. But if, if there are things that are relevant throughout, we'll try to wind them into uh, the conversation as we go along um, as well. So without further ado, um, Let's just look at the partnership. So if we go to um, Rob, first of all, so you've explained that you've got that mix between working with BU and UHD and also a local and a national view of things. So could you tell us about how working across organisations has benefited your particular work and your research, both from a clinical and an academic perspective? Uh, yes, I think it's been sort of mutually beneficial. Uh, my clinical work drives my research. My research drives my my clinical work. Uh, so, you know, for a good example, uh, if we look at orthopaedics, one of the big problems is, is demand. Uh, and therefore, doing the best operation most efficiently is important. But we also have to look at it laterally and say, well, are there other treatments that could prevent people having an operation? Uh, and that was behind uh, our research into exercise and specific exercises that one could do for conditions like osteoarthritis, the hip, uh, which led us to develop a, a, a program in Bournemouth University that then we collaborated with University Hospitals Dorset to deliver, um, which we estimate um, over five years prevents about 60% of the patients doing this exercise course actually having surgery and potentially a nine million pound saving to the health service that can be reinvested. So I think one feeds off the other. And I think that's what it's exciting about the uh, Bournemouth University, University Hospitals Dorset partnership. Uh, by working together, they can achieve a lot more because Bournemouth University can have some great ideas, but if they can't trial them out and develop them clinically, they may just remain a dusty PhD. Uh, and university... Hospitals also has ideas of, of med tech developments that it requires, but it doesn't have the resources and knowledge, say, of mechanical engineering and things that the university has to develop them. So I think, as you say, we had the 
one year meeting of the anniversary of working together. Uh, and I think this is really going to be the engine room of, of how we drive things forward, not only of Dorset, but our successful ventures will then be taken up by the rest of the country. Sorry, just unmuting myself there. Thank you, Rob. I, I think that illustrates for us really effectively the impact um, that those kind of partnerships can have, not, not just on the actual, you know, you and your individual profile, but the impacts on the actual care for people and the development innovations and things like that. So that that's really positive. If I could maybe move over to you, Richard, um, just thinking about the par partnership, and obviously we, we've said it's been there for about a year now. So what changes have you seen in relation to collaboration and knowledge sharing and innovation? Can you give us some examples of that, please? Of course, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, so, um, as, as Rebecca said, there, there was a relationship before, but we've now formalised that. And when we merged on the 1st of October uh, 2020, that, that allowed us to perhaps structure that more. And in particular, to go beyond the sort of traditional areas of work, particularly around education uh, and training. Um, and so, as a result of that, we've, we've as big organisations, have aligned our um, strategies. So, we've got, for instance, number one, um, our research strategy has been aligned and particularly those sort of common areas that national industrial strategy would point towards, such as um, uh, age, healthy ageing um, and, of course, the role of med tech uh, and science led recovery. Um, practical examples, uh, you know, the most probably visible one is the clinical trials unit, uh, which is set up in UHD and is um, undertake a lot of uh, both um, research trials, commercial trials and so on. And it's obviously had a uh, COVID trials. Um, it's been a very busy year with with pandemic uh, and recovery, but I think even despite that, we could point to quite a lot of progress, um, but probably more than anything, it's about the relationships. And so as medtech entrepreneurs, as our audience here today, it, it, the relationships are important um, and timing. So um, what I would suggest is that we've got more of a structure now, as both the NHS locally and the university, to perhaps support some of those innovations um, uh, because timing opportunity spotting is is really tricky and time consuming. So that's the way that I think we've got more of that infrastructure coming into place now. So, um, so those are some of the sort of early early things we're pointing towards. But um, as, as was mentioned in the keynote speeches at the beginning, um, there are lots of other opportunities that the university in the video sort of played out. So I won't, I won't repeat those, but but uh, the the um, uh, first, the cell is pretty fertile, so uh, be interested in the questions, maybe, maybe to explore a few more of those. But um, what, one sort of example trial is, you know, drone delivery for medical supplies and uh, and equipment is, for instance, one of the trials going on. So also a whole range of things, but a lot of the messaging, I say, is about creating that long term infrastructure. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. And and that is, you know, in the year that we, we've we worked together as a steering group, it does take time and it also takes a lot of effort to get those relationships set up and actually keep the momentum going. And obviously we, we were doing that in, in the face of COVID as well. So we had additional uh, challenges, I suppose, that everyone faced in lots of different ways. But it it has been really useful to set up and maintain those relationships because that seems to be part of the key um, to, to partnerships. Um, Rebecca, I know that you'll have some, um, maybe some examples and some thoughts about how universities can actually work together with industry easily. Um, I'm not suggesting it is easy, but smoothly, I suppose. Um, and maybe just talk us through some examples that you've got. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I suppose what we've heard already from both uh, Rob and from Richard are that within this space, you know, there can be some uh, hugely impactful um, outcomes, but actually taking it down perhaps to more of a micro level, what, what we've seen is that for these industry university collaborations to be successful it requires a two-way flow of information and ideas 
Um, and we've got another population alongside the academics. We have our students. And so we've got our industry partners, we've got the academic staff, the faculty staff, and we've got our students as well. And so we've got almost a three-way flow of information. And, and Rob very clearly said, you know, his, his practice informs his research, his research informs his practice, and that almost certainly then is reflected in his teaching as well. And for me as, a, as an HR practitioner, um, that's a real way of exciting my students. So I'm interested at the moment in what's causing HR professionals to stop and think about their policies and their practices. And literally in conversation, so we have uh, mentoring relationships. So uh, academics can mentor industry professionals. Industry professionals can work with our academics or ask our academics to be involved in short-term projects. And that allows us to keep our, our professional practice updated then we go into the classroom and our students are motivated because they know they're talking about contemporary issues. Um, and then the other things we can do are things like, uh, again, I suppose from an HR perspective, we know that organizations, there's a constant struggle for talent. And we within the university have a responsibility to our students to prepare them for that future world of work. But we also need to help industry in terms of having the types of people that they want to hire and employ at the end. The more we can expose our students to the culture of industry and the workplace, the more likely they are to be better prepared. But also, industry is having to get to grips with this you know, multi-generational workforce, and they need to know more about the student mindset, you know, what's going on in these young people's heads? What are they looking for from employers? So we've had examples of guest speakers where guest speakers will come in and deliver just a 20 minute talk, but then they use, a, a, you know, a tool that allows the students to provide anonymous feedback about you know, what would you be looking for from an employer that's going to make them an attractive place for you to work? And so, again, it's a really nice example of this two way flow of information. It's uh, we have things like reverse mentoring as well. So we have mentoring and reverse mentoring, and that can be between academic staff and industry, between students and industry. Um, so so that happens quite a lot. Case studies are great uh, where industry can have you know, perhaps a smaller problem. Um, but we have some that are smaller problems and almost like hackathons where students will just work on those and in an intense period. And we have those within the MBA program, which is like a, a one week, two week period where they'll really get to grips and go away and research and come back with ideas. But equally, equally, we have consultancy projects where students are working on behalf of industry and they work over a, you know, a longer period and have access to different I suppose it's just that, isn't it? Access to different ideas and different perspectives, maybe. But guest lecturers work, consultancy projects, placements. So are students going on longer term placements, but equally going on short term uh, Easter break placements? And I, I'm loath to use the word work experience, but experiences of. Um, and so we'll have site visits. Um, and... Uh, I suppose for industry as well, the other thing that we do are things like um, CPD, um, continuous professional development and, and short courses, longer term courses. And I'm sure you know, Lois could talk more to some of those. But, you know, these are just um, uh, opportunities for smaller interventions. And they all just facilitate this ongoing discussion between the two parties and knowledge exchange. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rebecca. And I think just to, to add to that around the sort of executive education or sort of CPD aspects, um, there's a number of things that the business school is, is currently uh, working with UHD on. Some of that is related to um, senior level apprenticeships where we actually work jointly um, to actually provide a curriculum and a way of working that actually allows people to eventually move towards getting an apprenticeship qualification, but they could, if they wanted, get an academic qualification alongside that um, from BU. 
So there, there's lots of different ways that, that UHD can support our academic and professional staff in, in the university to develop their skills. But equally, we also are able to work with UHD to support their staff to develop. And there's a lot of work that we're also discussing around things like leadership development, where we, we can really work closely um, mm -hmm. with the senior level teams. And yeah. that that's a great experience for us as a university to have the privilege of being able to do that, to work with medical and non-medical um, colleagues in UHD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you, Liz. I needed to kind of tee you up for that because I wasn't sure how much we wanted to say about that yet or not. So I thought I would just leave it hanging for you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's part of the, I, I guess these things are examples of things that we're not finished developing yet, yes. but we're we're on the way to developing them. And in, in a year of having a partnership, you know, I, th I think there's been a lot achieved on so many different levels that we could possibly cover it all today, but yeah. you know, it's it, it's sort of ta tangible developments, I suppose. Yeah. And actually, we did have uh, um, we had the head of innovation and change from UHD come in to deliver a lecture. And what was so lovely there on this guest talk was uh, we'd been talking about change management, and yes, we can talk the theory and we can give the stats about how often change fails and what are the key reasons for failure. And But what was so amazing was that uh, Deborah Matthews from UHD was able to tell a story and make this theory come alive for the students. And I mean, apart from her being an amazing uh, speaker, it was just wonderful because uh, the the feedback from students then about how they managed to grasp these concepts, why they could then see that they were really important, the impact it can make, um, those contributions to their learning, I don't think we can un underestimate those really, they're really powerful. Can I just jump in there as well as there's been um, a question in the chat which um, kind of relates to what you've actually just been saying about the um, the crossover and changes in that within um, academia and industry. So the um, question was, if there is a big gap between the academics and industry requirements, what can be done to bridge this gap? Does anyone have any um, comments oh, in relation to skills? Does anyone have any comments there of how that could uh, be addressed? I can just say the way that we've tackled it is that really all our projects that we do uh, have an industry partner and have a a university partner so I've got a keynote speech speech later and I'll go through those uh, but some of it is we'll, we'll develop some basic research within the university and then we'll look for an industry partner uh, and it's interesting things some some grants you have to have an industry partner and a university partner so Innovate UK is a good example so we wanted to develop a transfer board for people in wheelchairs uh, and we had some ideas around it, but we uh, partnered with a local company called Buckingham Healthcare. Uh, and then the two of us together applied for a government grant. Uh, and then we developed a product which is now called the Glide Board uh, and is manufactured. Uh, so that's built in. How we try and encourage that, uh, one of our professors, uh, Professor Ian Swain from the Department of Engineering, uh, has got a background in, in setting up companies. He set up uh, Oddstock Medical, which is a medical device uh, company. It's a not-for-profit making organization. So he understands about patents. He understands about uh, selling products as well. So I think Bournemouth University is probably unusual compared to other universities in that it's one of the few uh, universities where we expect all our students to spend some time in, in industry as part of their degree courses. Uh, and that's the same for the academics as well. They come from a background of industry they're working with industrial partners so when we're, we're certainly not an ivory tower uh, but I, I like to see all our projects as a combination of uh, an industri industry collaborating with with academics so hopefully that answers and shows you how I think things are different Bournemouth is a new university and was previously voted by the Guardian as the best new university uh, in the UK and I think it, is, it has this different model than other universities that is particularly successful in this field. Thanks Rob and just on the just thinking about the, the collaboration aspect and thinking more about 
I suppose the, the experience of mindsets of academics and industry practitioners. Richard, could you say a bit about how you think the the link and the network and that kind of culture of collaboration has developed with UHD and BU? Oh, you're muted. Apologies. I was just saying thanks. I'll just also bring in the fact and, and the third party about about um, uh, um, industrial collaboration as well. So that I suppose the the key bit for me is really understanding what objectives partners have uh, and what systems and processes, because it can be hugely frustrating uh, to have the governance of different organisations uh, coming together. So so one of the areas probably to sort of reflect on a bit is about how NHS has obviously patient safety, has uh, taxpayer money uh, responsibilities, um, and therefore the introduction of change needs to happen within a governance framework. And that can be hugely frustrating when you've got a product that you think is the best thing ever, um, how you get that in, into practice. So there's definitely um, things we're looking at in terms of how we can get um, both post holders between the university and the um, uh, NHS to uh, be shared, but I think increasingly also about how to introduce new products in safe safe ways, and that's both at, obviously at different stages of, of of development, at trial or or actually rollout stage. So a lot of that is about understanding the um, processes and why those processes are in place. And as a board member, I've got to sort of say I, I know they're really frustrating often. Uh, but uh, uh, actually working with them, understanding why they're there is is some some of that. And so um, the more that um, UHD and the wider NHS and uh, Portland University can align those uh, and streamline those, then then that would actually help as well. But I think a lot of it is about the um, the networks, as we, we sort of touched on earlier, um, around that collaboration. So a lot of that is as as Rob gave you examples. You know, people knowing each other knowing what research interests, what academic interests, and also what are the issues we're trying to solve. Um, and so um, uh, just an example, you know, in, in our stroke unit, we, we actually had a charitable fundraising. We've introduced the, uh, the Walker bot, which is uh, the first NHS uh, example of um, assisted walking, uh, um, which has taken the what's three physios down to down to one um, and it's about a quarter of the time to get people back to full recovery. Um, so that was a, a, a bit of kit which um, hadn't yet been fully rolled out uh, uh, in, in, in the UK. Um, and we were sort of first to that. And there's lots of other examples in diagnostics um, where um, UHD has been the um, international or European exemplar site. Um, and so it's some of those relationships we built up over time that allows um, early product testing um, and part of that is is the mutual win-wins of uh, obviously benefits for our patients benefits for for our taxpayers so it's probably just trying to align those incentives that are the areas where we're trying to um, find a way through um, and 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 prioritize which which areas we put the effort into because obviously there isn't a shortage of of things we can be doing and that's part of the part of the issue of um, uh, having those processes is identifying those wins that are worth putting the effort into Thanks, Richard. I think that those are really useful examples of the reality of, of the partnership. Um, I think that we have another question in the chat, Rachel. Um, yeah, that's right. There's a question um, from Philip Bell um, that asks, how can members of the public with an idea have access to the development journey? Um, I'm not sure which one of you are maybe able to take this one, Rob. Uh, yes, yeah, so there are a couple of ways. Um, it is COVID times, but normally uh, both University Hospitals Dorset and BU have open days for the public. Uh, and I've taken part in those. I always find them fascinating to see what's going on. But uh, both um, in the hospital, uh, Richard and his team make available at the weekend the hospital public areas. Uh, and then we set up stands uh, showing things like the, the, the walkabout robot. Uh, and things there and we set up stands and patients can come and have a go on our equipment and see what it's like and in the university as well uh, we specialize in 
uh, virtual and augmented reality surgery. Uh, so patients can come along to the university and actually perform an operation without causing any harm. So we hope next year, COVID permitting, that the university and the hospital will be able to go back uh, to that. Um, uh, so we hope to go back to that. Uh, also, uh, members of the public can contact us directly. Uh, and uh, if they're interesting ideas, we're very happy to meet them. Often, uh, it's a question of that we can't personally help them, but we can point, the, point them in the uh, right direction. So someone may come and talk to me about Parkinson's disease. Uh, that's obviously something I know uh, nothing about, but I can tell them which neurologist or which part of the university. Um, the final point I'd like to make is that often the best ideas come from areas of need. So it may be a nurse or a carer identifying an area of need rather than the solution. One of the problems is that people often develop a bit of technology or have an idea and then try and apply it to everything. And I would say do it the other way around. Find an area of need. If you want to improve, say, the health care of disabled people, when working with them or if you've got a relative, what's the most challenging thing? And then come, come to us and say, well, one of them was that we can't transfer our grandmother with arthritic hips and knees from the wheelchair to the chair. And that sparked the idea that, yeah, a transfer board is just a board, but could we develop a high tech transfer board, which we did with a local company, the Glide Board. So um, often it's those questions and they can come from members of the public, uh, nurses, doctors or anyone. But I would say, look out next year. If there are open days at the university or hospital, come along to them. If you've got a particular idea, uh, you can look us up on the, the websites, the hospital, the university, and give us an idea. We can't say we can develop all of them, but we can point you in the right direction. Thanks, Rob. And also, it might be useful for, for Rachel just to say a little bit about her role, because if anybody wanted to get in touch with Rachel, Although she works in the business school, she has that opportunity to network more widely across the university and has a huge amount of experience of doing that. So Rachel might be a useful contact too. Yeah, sure. So thank you. I um, have worked at the university for over 10 years in like a networking capacity, uh, doing various other things, but mainly just talking to people. Um, so if you do want to get in touch with the university and work with the university, do feel free to give me um, a shout either on LinkedIn or, or whatnot. My um, LinkedIn link is uh, in my bio, which hopefully you should access on this platform somewhere. Um, so yes, do, do get in touch and uh, we will see what we can do with you. Brilliant. Thanks, Rachel. Um, now we're kind of, we've got about uh, five or 10 minutes left ish. So I, I think we'll move now to um, just thinking about the future of industry um, university collaborations um, and maybe just, just ask uh, some of our panel to talk to us about what their thoughts are as to where this could lead in the future. So um, if I come to Rebecca first. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a tougher question because uh, maybe uh, if we're looking at this particular partnership between Bournemouth University and UHD, um, I feel I can answer that slightly more clearly in that it comes down to something that Richard said about structure, because we were already collaborating and there were some great pockets of, of things going on and things were happening and things were being delivered. But actually, now that we have a strategic partnership and we have some structure, um, we're able to just collaborate more effectively, really. And, and so I think we will be able to achieve more and more quickly as we've broadened the relationship beyond the traditional uh, health faculty and now you know, SciTech were already involved to an extent but now the business school is involved as well we're able to bring in um, the faculty of media and communications and you know some of the work that was happening there around uh, COVID messaging and, and how to use um, uh, how to use 
I want to, I don't want to say comic book, but it is almost you know different forms of messaging uh, to get this uh, to get things across. And those research based and evidence informed ideas, I think, are just so powerful. So you know, I think within our partnership, we're able to get more of the right people speaking. Uh, more quickly, more effectively, and so we can just keep going. But then it's about um, embedding that. And I suppose the the BU um, idea of a fusion between professional practice, between research, and between education is it's just perfect for this type of relationship. You know, you can see all the things that we've been speaking about before and how those things go together to to. Um, deliver something very powerful and then within the business school we know actually from our research that the majority of our students undertake a business degree because they're interested in their future employability so we take that motivation that drive from them very seriously and we embed that within uh, our program and that's where our industry partnerships really help strengthen that program so it's not just talk it's we live and breathe that throughout our curriculum throughout our extracurricular activities and our industry partners are critical to achieving that effectively and and that's also shown in the results when you look at our students and their post-graduation earnings and their post-graduation you know how where they end up later um so yeah there's plenty in the research about the skills gaps and digital skills gaps and the challenges that employers face. And so, yes, we're responding to what our students need, but also, as Lois said, we have a responsibility to the society and our local population. And so improving our students' employability is good for the students, but it's also good for industry and society. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Rebecca. Now, um, I just want to give Rachel the opportunity to maybe share with us from your experience of um, working in partnerships beyond um, UHD and from the experience that you've got, Rachel, what would you say about the future of industry university collaboration? Um, the, it's big. <laughs> um, it seems to be growing um, from my experience of working at BU, um, specifically in that collaboration role over the past 10 years or so, is that it's just getting more, um, more prominent and that there are lots of opportunities for different businesses, organisations, uh, not only locally, but nationally and globally to work with universities to develop their innovative like innovation piece um, or even just like a, um, a, a more sort of hands off engagement of advertising a, a job with us or something like that. There are lots of different opportunities of getting involved with um, universities and, and uh, for universities to help inform the future of industry because we as um, I think it was Rebecca said earlier we've got so much um, research um, and theory um, and even though at the university we do do a lot in terms of practice as well it's working with industry to sort of move um, move industry along further with um, our learnings from our research um, and also help in have, helps inform teaching as well to enhance our student experience and make sure that those students that we are teaching can then go out into industry and then share what they've learned there too. Um, so yeah I just see it as being a um, much bigger piece than what it is at the moment and just continuing to grow that collaboration thing but that seems to be running across various different industries that i'm looking at at the moment as well collaboration is huge especially in regards to funding too actually i think um richard or robert mentioned earlier about having um funding applications and bringing in industry there are lots of um funding streams that are out are looking for that collaborative piece too Great. Thanks, Rachel. Now, we've got five minutes left and I'm going to give the last words around university industry collaborations to both Rob and Richard. So I'm going to come to Rob first. What would you be your final, I suppose, piece of advice or, or comment around these types of collaborations? Well, I think there's an there's analogy that, that shows how important these collaborations are. I was uh, speaking to someone in the bike industry and he was describing how they develop uh, a new bike to be sold. So uh, 
uh, the company will speak to a professional racer. He'll ask what he expects from a racing bike and then they'll produce a prototype and they'll provide that to the professional rider. And then he expects the professional rider to give him feedback each day and he modifies that bike until the professional rider is pleased with it. The professional rider will then test it in racing and if it's successful, the, the manufacturer will then manufacture and sell that bike. And that's really what we're seeing with Bournemouth University and UHD. The one person on the, on the side has an idea, the other side produces a prototype and produces feedback, and then that product then develops, whether it's a service uh, or a product. And I think where the collaboration, where we've led the way, is that we're now talking about passporting, so that, uh, that if people's contracts in one hospital are the same as in the university, that if we get R&D approval in the university, it applies in the hospital uh, and vice versa. And that's going to break down the uh, the barriers. But it's that that continual back and forth between the university uh, and industry or the user that that's key to develop those products. And that that's what kills a lot of products that people have great ideas and a great product, but it's not practical. Uh, and uh, someone needs to say, speak to Rich and say, what's your number one, two and three uh, problems that you would like solved, and then it's for us, the university, to to see if we can come up with some solutions. Hey, say Richard, try these out, give us feedback, and then we'll modify them. And that that's what I hope we'll we'll see getting bigger over uh, over the future coming years. But it is that 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 very close cooperation. Thanks, Rob. And we'll give the final final word to you, Richard, from your perspective. Thanks, Lewis. Um, as, as Rob says, um, I, I, I'm not in any shortage of problems to solve. So uh, I've got I've got plenty. So um, and, and and across the entire NHS. So um, with healthcare representing about 10% um, of uh, uh, GDP, it, it clearly is is a big area. Of course, our our, our demands are probably at 10 or uh, 12 or 15% of uh, uh, GDP. So so it's not as if we're sat around with lots of spare resources. So that's where that alignment about problem solving um, and particularly areas that are going to reduce um, workload on staff um, and that that's going to be fundamental in both health and social care so um, and what I'd say the the university relationship brings is that not, not not just that collaboration which is absolutely essential and really exciting and those different perspectives but also the rigor of, of academic um, evaluation and as Rob gave in his example that that feedback it is too often that in in uh, healthcare, uh, it's do one thing, fix it, move on to the next problem. Actually, it's that constant uh, improvement cycle that is is critical. Uh, and, and Rob's a great practitioner of this, of, of that um, learn, do, study, you know, uh, approach. And so that that I think is going to be um, for me one of the most exciting things that, particularly using say the multitude of uh, skills across the health uh, um, business. Uh, technology uh, and other faculties to, to really bring those the, um, the the synergy between those. So for me, I think it's we're very early days. We're we're probably only at scratching the surface of that opportunity. But I think, and as Rob said, that 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 transfer between the NHS uh, and healthcare more broadly, um, academia and and industry, that there's a very rich area that I think the UK is is particularly strong at. Um, uh, and, and I think within Dorset, we've got a great opportunity there. So, so do please speak to us if you're in the in the in the panel uh, in the, in the audience, please to speak to us on the panel. I'm sure we'd be happy to help. Thanks. Thanks very much, Richard. So, um, we're just about out of time, but I want to say a massive thank you to all of our panel um, who've answered questions and given such great examples today of how uh, university industry collaboration actually works and where we've got to with ours. Um, there are no more questions in the chat, but as Richard says, if you want to contact any of us, our contact details will be uh, on our profiles on this system. Um, or alternatively, if you contact Rachel, she will then make sure that, that we get together and, and actually have a chat with you um, if you want to continue on conversations. So, Thank you to everybody on the panel and thank you to everybody who's attended today and thank you for your questions and we will leave it there.